Now, we are on the air. Can you hear me? I've heard Richard. Yeah. We're going to try a, a live translation. Okay. Santiago is a lovely town. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Did people hear that in Spanish? Say something in English. Say, yes. Okay. Your turn. Let's see if we can hear anything in Spanish. Vale. Eh, so we have our guests here today who are incredible, incredible, and they're thinking about translators and interpreters while they're doing their job. Thanks so very much. I didn't. <laughs> no, okay, so in that case, we might, we might be in trouble, no? It's, there's only one line. Okay. Can we try the uh, span? Oops, it's gone off. There we go. That's fine. Oh, hang on. Can we try something in Spanish again? In a couple of minutes, we'll begin this third regaifa about science from this season. Hope you're getting me right. Hello, hello, hello. Try an English channel. It's channel number two. <laughs> and that sounded beautiful. <laughs> okay, so it works? Yeah. I, I can now listen to somebody talking to me in English and understand it perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <coughs> okay, so before we get started, I, we could explain to you how this works, those little devices you have with you. Just make sure that your mobile phones are on flat mode so as not to interfere with the microphones. Okay, so before we get started, I'm going to explain to you if you want to use simultaneous interpreting devices, in order to be able to listen to the interpreting, you have to make sure that your headphones are correctly and match them to the device, so connected, then press play, select the channel, one or two, one's going to be Spanish and two is going to be English. And you can also use the selector on the side to make sure that you can change the volume. It doesn't seem very difficult. Who wants to live forever? This is the title of a very well-known song that was written by Queen. The lyrics of that song have been written by Brian May, who, as you well know, was a guitar player and also an astronomist. So this particular issue is not something I'm telling you about, just as an anecdote. It's actually quite important because it has 
important philosophical implications. And then on the other hand, it is a question that is an actual question that loads of people are asking themselves and also researchers in the 21st century. It is a question who wants to live forever that we're trying to reformulate in the following way. Should science help us live forever? So welcome to the Gay Fast de Ciencia, Intelligent Debates for totally exciting topics. Aragaifa, using just basically the Galician word, and you looked it up in the dictionary, is basically a debate which is improvised and normally using poetry, which normally takes place during weddings. And those who win get a very special prize, which is more or less like a loaf of bread, which symbolizes who's the winner who's best at debating. So in this Aragaifa, we're going to have those elements. And obviously, it is important that all of our guests use prose, not poetry, but you have to make sure that you come up with ideas and interesting contributions. Reggae First de Ciencia is a program for scientific dissemination within the University of Santiago de Compostela, which is sponsored by FECID, which is the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. This is our third debate of the second season. And it is quite special because it is the first time that we have an international debate, as you're going to see in a second. And for those of you who are watching the live streaming, we'd like to tell you about the fact that we're going to have two different channels for the streaming. One of them is going to have the English version and the other one is going to have the Spanish version. By my side, I have the two teams that are going to defend different positions. That is the positive and negative position regarding this question. But the most important thing, and that's the most important thing about debates, are nuances, hues, shades and meanings that can be contributed by different people that are here today on stage. So I'm going to go straight to introducing to you our lecturers here today. We have on the yes team, Carlos Martinez, who is a professor and researcher in the National Center of Biotechnology. He is an expert in immunology and in, in the world of um, science, scientific pol politics, he has very important roles, such as, for example, being the chairman of the seat and also the Secretary of State for Research. I would also like to let you know about the fact that we have Aubrey de Grey, who is a herontologist and scientific director of the Science Research Foundation. The Science Research Foundation is a biomedical organization for California, which is not profit making and is basically focused on researching aging and all its implications. On the other hand, on the No team, I am pleased to introduce to you uh, Rachel Falkini, who is uh, a professor of bioherontology from the University of Brighton. He is an expert in uh, cellular senescence and aging. He has received several accolades and prizes on his defense of aging population and um, loads of research projects that he's been involved in. And we also have Vicente Elber, who is a PhD in uh, law philosophy from the University of Valencia. He is an expert as well in human rights, uh, political ecology, bio ethics and by law and he's been member of different bioethical committees of Spain and the Council of Europe so this will not be a reggae for the fear it wouldn't be our style if we didn't give a chance to people to vote so I want to know what you think here today in our audience so that's why you all have that remote control and let's proceed to vote in fact, you can start voting from this particular moment. For those of you who are not aware of how this works, the first vote is the only one that goes, and you have to answer this question, just basically by pressing one, two, or three. So, one would be science should help us live forever, two, no, and three, I don't know. So, uh, as per usual, I would also like to explain that what we want to find out about it, just basically get to gauge what your opinion is. This is not a debate about, you know, winning team and non-winning team and defeated team, but I just want to make sure that during this uh, hour of debate, the people on this stage will be able to induce changes in our audience and make them change their minds, if possible. So, if you're in the audience or you're watching the live streaming, you can actually participate in the debate by using our hashtag on Twitter, ReggaeFast17, and I'd like to tell you that I'm talking a little bit slowly to make sure that translation is working at all times. So the organization of this debate has four blocks. The first block is a general introduction. The second block will be a series of uh, 
topic focus questions. Third block will be the questions from the audience. And if you want to ask questions on Twitter, you can also do so. And if we can get those questions, we will also include them. And last but not least, we'll get to a round of conclusions and a final voting. And having said all this, let's just open up a debate of this Reggae de Ciencia. I would like to invite Carlos Martinez to come closer um, to the microphone and use the first six minutes to present his initial position. Thank you so very much. Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking all of the people in the audience, the young people in the audience, because I can see that there are quite a lot of young people here today to participate in this event, because I understand that there's another event that is quite important as well that's happening in Santiago de Compostela, which is a cinema festival. I think that science and cinema are two very important creative activities for human uh, beings, but I obviously would like to thank you for choosing this one, because after all, science has demonstrated, um, just basically to answer the question that has been formulated to us that it's always been a very powerful tool to describe the world, to understand the world, and within that particular world it's been particularly successful to understand a very important part of our debate, which is health, and most importantly health heading towards the future. Roughly a hundred years ago, the population in the world lived approximately 45 to 50 years, but now the lifespan reaches 80 to 84 years. So if actually you're a female, you can live a little bit longer than a male. And this was due to the fact that science understood the reasons of mortality of the population. So it was absolutely, basically infectious diseases and developed a series of research strategies to be able to fight those infectious diseases and causes of mortality. And we we have antibiotics and vaccines, which were extremely successful in preventing infectious diseases. Vaccines did not only contributed to eliminate many of the infections around the world, but also they contributed to eliminate uh, causes of mortality and diseases that did not exist in the world anymore, such as, for example, smallpox and polio. Actually, only 150 cases of polio were detected last year. So the causes of mortality are not infections anymore, although they obviously exist, but we all have different elements and alterations in our DNA. So science, once again, has contributed with incredible knowledge to be able to understand the reasons of those diseases and to try to fight against them. And for that reason, they developed what we so call um, precision medicine, which is basically focused on trying to identify what are the main reasons for the diseases that each and every one of us suffer from. Because what we have discovered in the last few years is that there's no disease as such. We have ill people, and we need to diagnose those ill people properly and treat them with the adequate treatment. But what we've also learned is that uh, the biggest risk factor to develop any of the diseases that are risk factors for human beings today, such as, for example, heart disease, neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, or inflammatory disease, is basically aging. All of these diseases, uh, which lead to the death of an important part of the population, uh, increase significantly with age, and that's why it's science. When trying to understand why people today uh, die at a particular moment of the lifetime, tries to understand aging, but not only understand why aging happens itself, but also try to fight against aging. And this particular line of trying to contribute with solutions to the problems that are connected to aging, science has developed methodologies to understand aging and has developed um, experimental models whereby we can actually expand a life expectancy by 12%. This is basically animal models that use um, the drosophila fly and nematodes, but in certain experimental conditions that are basically um, low in calorie diet and with um, energy restrictions, these are animals, the fly and this nematode that can actually double the lifespan. So this is not only important in terms of experimental conditions, but it's also important to underline the fact that uh, we have detected a series of biochemical signs, a series of genes that are directly involved in the possibility of doubling the lifespan of those animal models. Because to a great extent, um, the genetic models that are used in animals are basically transmitted adequately into the human species. And if this is possible, is it possible to use these tools in human, human beings? Well, actually, we have identified a series of treatments and actually also pharmacological structures that somehow can contribute 
to reduce or uh, to eliminate causes of death in human beings and mammals, such as, for example, mice. So it's important as well that many of us drugs that are used in experimental models are still not liable to be used, obviously, with the human beings because we are not aware of the side effects and long-term effects. But some of those drugs are actually used for some diseases in human beings, such as diabetes or, for example, uh, graft rejection. These are the same drugs that in uh, animal models double lifespan. So the main challenge that we have in, in medicine and in this wave of knowledge which basically aims to prevent and develop a disease and aging is basically not about doubling or expanding a lifespan but it has two other aims. First of all, preventing aging because we don't want to live a lot more, we want to live better. And secondly, if possible, what can we do for those people who are already, uh, let's say, in, in the last stages of their lives and are more liable to develop these diseases, how can we actually step back in time or regenerate them to make them younger people? And in both strategies, there are experimental models, actually in mammals, with genetical manipulation that are liable to decrease the aging process, to make it step backwards and to revert aging itself to be able to expand our possibilities as human beings and to remain as, as, as long as possible as, as young people. So if the science allows to do so, we will be able to develop a series of biological revolutions which are more or less in line with astrophysics physics with gravitational waves and I hope that this is what the future brings to us. Thank you so very much. So now we give the floor to Richard. I'd like to thank Carlos for giving us a very clear and uh, concise summary of the starting position. You will hear a great deal of agreement tonight. You will also hear some points of disagreement, and I think it's very clear that um, we state that ground out. We believe that science should not help us live forever for the following reasons. Firstly, and most simply, it can't. We can ask many things of science or scientists, but we cannot ask the impossible. Forever means forever, not a thousand years, not 10,000 years. It means all the time there is. Physicists calculate that it's about 100 billion years from now until the end of the universe. That's 20 times the age of our sun. Forever is a long time as stars count time. So when somebody says, I don't want to live forever, I always say, that's good, because you do not have the option, <laughs> okay? People who say, I want to live forever, are typically talking about wanting a life much longer than the maximum today. They're thinking perhaps of a life lasting 300 years. Such a lifespan might seem like living forever today, but if you are celebrating your 299th birthday, then it will not. Okay? Long lives and immortality are different situations and different ethical arguments apply to them. I think tonight we will discuss only the former, which may someday be possible, and probably ignore immortality, which isn't. Science can and should help us live healthier lives by removing as many of the problems of late life as possible. All those interested in aging research agree on this. The difference is that those seeking to improve health would be happy with no increase in maximum lifespan at all, or with a small increase as a side effect of making you healthy. However, those seeking great, greatly extended lives see producing healthy old people only as a prerequisite, a stepping stone. They would be greatly disappointed if all they could do was give everybody a normal life in perfect health. I, on the other hand, would be triumphant. We all agree that great progress is being made and that the amounts being spent on this crucial research are so small it is almost an insult. 
If we could make older people as healthy as we've made older lab animals, then America alone could save enough money in hospital bills to give everyone on Earth clean water for 30 years. Health is a goal everyone thinks is worthwhile. Years beyond our normal span are less desired by most people and are opposed by many for valid ethical reasons. Why then should science make enemies of those who are in fact our friends and who should be the beneficiaries of our work? Some treatments, such as rejuvenating the immune system to prevent thousands of older people dying from influenza, could be ready for use in a few years. Others, such as drugs to remove senescent cells, may take 30 years to reach the clinic. I hope such drugs can be produced. 30 years is a difficult time to make predictions about the future of science, or indeed anything else. I can predict what tomorrow will be like, and few of you will care. I can predict what 10,000 years from now will be like, and few of you will care. But 30 years is near enough for many of us to expect to be there, yet far enough away for us not to be able to predict what will happen with any clarity. If you look at the history of predicting the future so over such a period, almost everyone who has tried to do so has failed. So when anybody says they have a plan to cure aging and it will take 30 years, please think carefully about how much to trust in it. And even if I am proved wrong and greatly extended lives are possible, I still believe there are good reasons why those who are most optimistic should think again. It is often spoken of as though eternal youth is being promised. An old person free of all age-related morbidity is not identical to a young person. We are different from the young because we have placed difficult personal choices and irrevocable decisions. We are, in the words of a famous Spanish philosopher, me and my biography, and it will always be that way. Thank you. Aubrey, por favor. Aubrey, you have the floor. Um, good evening. Uh, Buenas tardes. Thank you again for the uh, invitation and for coming to listen to us rather than going and watching films. Um, uh, uh, I would like to agree with the first thing that Richard said, which is that you are going to hear a lot of agreement uh, tonight. Uh, a lot of us are very much, well, I think we are all four of us in agreement that the overall goal of the work that people like Richard and myself and, um, and Carlos do is, uh, is valuable because we are trying to keep people healthy. And there is really no debate as to whether, people, uh, whether science should keep people healthy. But there are some disagreements as well. I think the most important thing that I want to get across to you that differs from what you just heard from Richard is I believe that it would not be satisfactory if we were to extend people's healthy lives without extending people's total lives. And I believe it would not be satisfactory because I believe that People who are healthy want to live longer and have the right to live longer, however long ago they were born. I do not think that it would be a good world in which everybody lived in a youthful state to the age of 100 and everybody died before the age of 101. Because I do not think that anybody who is healthy wants to die in the next year or at least if they do, we call them suicidal and we try to change their minds. It doesn't matter how long ago they were born. I believe that if we were to succeed in developing medicines that keep people healthy and youthful for a lot longer, then we would have a very different world. We should not be scared of that world, we should be preparing for it because it is probably coming fairly soon and whether it comes fairly soon or whether it comes slightly less soon, 
our goal is to make it come as soon as we can, so as to alleviate the suffering that aging causes for as many people as possible, as soon as possible. So, I come to the conclusion that yes, science should in fact be trying to get people to live forever, even if living forever is impossible, because there is no amount of life that is the right amount. However long ago you were born, you still have the desire and the right to stay healthy for some time longer and therefore as a side effect of health to stay alive for some time longer. Therefore, by mathematical induction, you are entitled and you have the right to live as long as you want. And if you don't want to live longer, even if you are still healthy, we will probably try to change your mind, even if... That's nice, okay. That's, <laughs> that's what we call living forever. <laughs> Um, <laughs> I have no idea how long I've been speaking for, uh, uh, but I, li I like this, yes, this is, the, this is the right way to do it. <laughs> Good. Uh, um, uh, right. Um, yes, <laughs> so, um, so uh, in conclusion, I would just say that we must also look at the feasibility of this work, and certainly when we make predictions about how soon we may make dramatic progress in the postponement of the ill health of old age, we must always emphasize how speculative those predictions are. We must always emphasize that it could take much longer than we think. But that is very different from refusing to make any predictions in the first place. Because the fact is, we are in a position today where we know a lot more about how the body works and about how aging works than we ever did before. And therefore, if people are left to, to extrapolate and to say, well, we have been saying we could bring aging under medical control for hundreds and hundreds of years, and we've always been wrong, therefore we're probably still wrong, then the situation that Richard described, where there is far too little money being spent on this work, is going to continue, because people are not going to vote for their tax dollars to be spent on the pursuit of something that they think is impossible. We therefore must be, we have a duty to actually give predictions, albeit speculative ones, about how long it's actually going to take. How long it, let's say, how long we have a 50-50 chance of having to wait before we can bring aging under the same kind of medical control that we already have over most infectious diseases. I think that we have a 50-50 chance of getting that sort of control within the next couple of decades. I think there's at least a 10% chance that we won't get there for 100 years. But that's fine. A 50-50 chance is quite enough to be worth fighting for. Thank you. Eh, gracias. Vicente, por favor. So, Vicente, I'll give you the floor now. Pues, muchas gracias por Thank you so very much for your invitation. And, um, well, it is my turn to basically defend uh, the position that responds negatively to the question, should science help us live forever? So, once again, we believe that this should be a no. And I understand that my position is negative for the following reasons that I'm going to try to present to you. First and foremost, I think it is impossible. Richard has already mentioned this. Richard has basically presented the fact that it is impossible, it is not desirable, and on top of that, it's unfair. So, why is it not desirable? It is not desirable because transforming our lives which are all deadly lives into immortal lives, uh, turns it into something that is completely different from what we actually are. 
And this involves two different things. On the one hand, we might not be happy with who we are. We are not happy about being uh, a limited existence in time. And on the other hand, we have to be completely sure that we will contribute by making life eternal, the creation of uh, our scientific knowledge will be certainly substantially better than what we are today as human beings. I understand that these two questions that I'm posing myself do not have an easy answer, but quite a lot of people that believe that life is excellent and wonderful as it is, uh, but obviously it's, it's quite obvious that people do not want to age uh, in a difficult manner or, or and die abandoned, uh, but there are quite a lot of people that believe that having a limited lifespan and a narrative existence with a beginning, a development and an end makes full sense. And on the other hand, there are a lot of reasons as well to believe that uh, that creation that was the consequence of scientific knowledge might not lead to something that is qualitatively better than what we have today. So. On the other hand, um, as I mentioned before, expanding our lifespan indefinitely completely changes our lives in a personal collective uh, viewpoint because on the one hand, it completely annihilates our narrative structure. We are not people who are born at a particular moment in time, uh, start up their lives, develop their existence throughout time, where we assume responsibilities, we start projects, and then a third stage, where we start um, a slow paced uh, decline in our existence until we finally disappear from stage. This will change completely. We will lose this narrative art. And on the other hand, this also requires an absolute and complete control of, um, let's say, the output and input factor. We can have the same birth rate if people live forever. We would have to control birth rate. Uh, and we would obviously have to control as well the output phenomena whereby people disappear. We will have to stop as well the right to suicide because there might be people who eventually do not feel like living anymore and want to die. But then on the other hand, we might also encounter a different situation whereby we would have to assess how socially interesting it is to have a given type of life when someone is a social problem and is ex has been existing for 3,000 years and creating turmoil and chaos for 1,000 years, is that person entitled to live forever? These are just questions that seem a little bit, you know, far-fetched, but they're actually very interesting questions because they actually stem from a scenario where you human life lives forever. Secondly, uh, this is unfair. I said it's not desirable, but I also said it is unfair. Why, why is it unfair? It is unfair because it basically splits humanity in two different teams, uh, those who have a limited lifespan and those who have an eternal lifespan. And uh, is it possible to coincide two different models of humankind where we have on the one hand human beings that live forever and those of us who just live the way human beings used to live and secondly which is even worse if we come to think about it does it make sense to uh, talk about an immortal life when life expectancy is around 80 years of age in developed countries but continues to be 45 years of age in third, uh, third world countries developing countries does it make sense to talk about immortal lives when taken sanitation, drinkable water, uh, food and health assistance to developing countries, we could actually increase by 25 years the life expectancy of those populations. <clears throat> Last but not least, as I said before, it's impossible. Why is it impossible? Because here, I understand that our aim should be to struggle against social deaths, deaths that can be prevented with not a lot of resources, and not um, intended to have this you know, end to the ontological dead of human beings. We are finite human beings. So as finite human beings, we don't want to dead and dead. we don't want to die as dogs, but we want to live with a life full of meaning, full of significance within the particular lifespan that has been given to us to develop our existence. Thank you so very much.
Thank you so very much to the lectures here today for sticking to time, even when time's not working. Um, the official chronometer is our friend Sulai who will give us signs. So we will hear those signs, acoustic signs, and those are the ones that are useful. Let's move on to the second part of the debate where we start thinking about specific issues, having to have like a give and take, back and forth, like a tennis match. Um, so let's start with the first question I would like to uh, present to our speakers. Is there a biological limit to human lifespan? And these questions will have to be answered by both teams collectively. So it is first the turn of uh, Carlos and Aubrey's team. Thank you. It's your turn now, yeah. Biological limit to human lifespan. Well, of course, you have to define the question a little bit more carefully than that. In fact, just a few days ago, a paper was published in a top journal, the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which claimed something like that statement, that there is a limit, not just to human lifespan, but to the lifespan of every multicellular species. But this claim has nothing to do with what we are talking about tonight. Because this claim is about what evolution is going to do. If you actually read the paper, it says why it's impossible for multicellular organisms to get into a state where they don't age. Actually, it doesn't quite even say that. It excludes certain simple multicellular organisms. But it doesn't say anything about medicine. Nothing at all. <coughs> but if you were to read the, n the reports on this paper that have come out in the popular press, you wouldn't know that. You would think that actually these researchers had mathematically shown that anti-aging medicine which actually works properly is impossible. And they didn't show anything of the kind. Now you may ask, why did they actually let their paper be misrepresented in this way? I can think of a few answers and I don't think much of them. But the fact is we absolutely do have a limit to human lifespan in the absence of medicine. But so what? There is absolutely nothing that says that the machine called the human body cannot be indefinitely preserved and maintained so that it continues to function in just the same way that there is nothing stopping a car from being maintained well enough that it continues to function. People who built cars a hundred years ago did not expect any of them to be working today. And not many of them are working today, but some of them are. They're working just as well as when they were built simply because they have benefited from an exceptional amount of preventative maintenance. And nobody looking at those cars today would bet against those cars still being just as functional a hundred years in the future. So it's going to be just the same for the human body. There is absolutely nothing in biology that tells us that preventative maintenance is inherently less possible for living organisms than it is for man-made machines like cars or aeroplanes. I think I'll give my 30 seconds to somebody else. Carlos, 20 seconds, you can use it if you want. You have 20 seconds. Well, it is true that in pragmatic terms, the studies that have been conducted so far about whether one can live forever or not, the maximum life expectancy is around 122 years, uh, actually, uh, that French woman that's still alive. So there are studies that have actually assessed uh, the number of people that have actually um, overcome this uh, uh, lifespan. So there are human beings that seem to have a limit which will be 122 years. So thank you. That's all. Let's change to the next team. Okay. I, I love going second because some of the work has already been done. There is always a biological limit to lifespan. And originally it was set by evolution in the context of small groups of people who could do little or nothing for each other when they became sick. In those days life expectancy was short and maximum lifespan <coughs> perhaps 100, although your chance of reaching it was thousands to one. 
However, if you can do something about the cause of illness, then life expectancy will lengthen greatly, and to a very small extent, lifespan appears to have already done so. For example, the maximum age at death in Sweden seems to have increased from 101 in 1860 to about 108 by 1990, at which point it seems to have stalled. I would be surprised if the technologies we are developing today did not push maximum lifespan back somewhat. Longer life is typically, but not always, associated with better health. Sometimes we see improved health and sudden death, but no lengthening in lifespan. It's worthwhile pointing out that our minds are also rooted in biology, and evolution has shaped their basic structure and their basic needs. And so your minds can tell you what the biological limit to life should be if you choose to ask and to ask others. It turns out that most people, about 60% of you, do not want unlimited lifespans, even if, uh, if perfect health is guaranteed. Instead, they want lifespans around the maximum we see today. This is not because they are scared into some sort of trance and cannot face the inevitable. It is because they are seeing the situation clearly. They see that a human is a body, a mind, and a biography. A centenarian, somehow given the body of a 30-year-old, will still have the biography of a centenarian. And that biography is filled, more or less, with the results of impossible choices, what philosophers call opting decisions, painful decisions, and the shadows of the roads you never took, the partner you never married, the person you never became. Being young has a great advantage in that your biography is short and hopefully happy. So anyone who thinks that a greatly extended lifespan will give you internal youth is in for a very nasty surprise. And thus, I think in the end, the ultimate biological limit to lifespan is in fact the philosophical one Vicente pointed out. A biography is a story and even the best story has to come to an end. I don't know if Vicente, you want to say something else to complete this word. You have 30 seconds. Well, there's nothing biologically that uh, can last forever. And I say this from my limited knowledge of biology. But on the other hand, human beings in a biological condition are able to do something that can um, last forever in other people's existences. And this may be something finite, but it might be interesting in absolute terms. And this can be the most elementary things, after all. Well, uh, we've just been there, using the time to its maximum. There are quite people here that want to clap their hands. If you want to give a round of applause, feel free to do so. And this is basically, you know, it cheers us up. We just have one minute for a counter. The same question is... Um, so it's the same question, just have one minute if you want to add something else or you want to reply to something that has been mentioned by the opposing team. It is obvious that the confusion is not looking for eternal life or endless life. This is the first debate that we're more or less in agreement with. It is true that uh, biology uh, can actually have cases of almost eternal life, like for example stem cells, and there are actually as well uh, certain living organisms that live for a lot of years. But is it possible for human beings to get to this particular stage? And the issue is that it might be very difficult, but maybe possible. So the debate that we should be focusing on is that despite this, we have tried to look for conditions whereby quality of life improves extraordinarily. So this association of improving the quality of life together with expanding a lifespan can actually lead to that negative position that Richard was mentioning, whereby people don't want to live any longer, because cultural changes are slower than scientific changes. So scientific changes would allow people to also change culturally, but this will take a little bit longer than expected.
Acaba... No. Acabamos el, el, lo que sería el primer asalto. Okay, so this is the first round. In this first round, the first team has a little advantage because it has the possibility of countering. But in this next round, it will be the other way around. So you will have the chance to have that extra minute. <laughs> So let's move on to the next question, which is uh, the following. Does uh, the technology required to extend lifespan exist or not? So it is now uh, uh, Vincent and Richard's turn. Uh, the question originally is if we, how, by how much, okay, if we allow significant lifespan extension to be 30 years, then I think the answer is probably no, the technology does not exist yet. But be prepared for a lot of use of the word if. Okay. The drug rapamycin famously extends lifespan in mice by about 15%. If you assume that the effects would be completely replicated in humans, which is plausible, but far from certain, and if you use current Spanish life expectancy, which is about 83 as the baseline, you might see an extension of about 12 years if you took it all your life. You could, I think, do better if you had a drug that completely removed senescent cells. Then, if humans behaved exactly like some of our transgenic mice, and the drug perfectly duplicated the effects, then deleting all the senescent cells in a Spanish citizen might give them an extra 20 years of life. This will happen if we have the $2.6 billion it takes to develop a drug and if we succeed. And when I think about drugs, I use the analogy of tamoxifen to help me here. It was a 30-year journey from first synthesis to clinical demonstration that it was beneficial for breast cancer. And if these extensions in lifespan sound quite impressive, please be aware that you can increase your life expectancy by five years by controlling your blood pressure with ordinary antihypertensives. I know I have to take them, and it is a real pain. Okay? Which brings us to a more realistic way of looking at how the interventions that will be developed will be used. I expect them to be medicines, and to be used like medicines, which means you don't take them unless you are at risk of or have developed a condition. Why don't you do this? Most drugs have side effects. Statins, for example, are highly beneficial in lowering cholesterol. In 10% of people, they have terrible effects on muscle. And the physically fit, particularly female humans with low body mass who go to the gym a lot, are exactly the people who are most at risk. So I think there are improvements that we could make more generally in health through the application of the knowledge that we've gained within the context of a public health care system. I think focusing on significantly extending human life has the danger that people misunderstand the objectives of the field and confuse philosophical never-never-land with practical medicine. You still have how much? No, 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 no. We didn't have a time, so we think that you can just complete. Just give away the time. Oh, okay. We just give it away. We have 30 extra seconds. Thank you so very much. Carlos. It's now your turn. Well, uh, in face of this question, the answer is yes, we have that technology. Undoubtedly, throughout history, as I mentioned at the beginning of my introduction, uh, there have been and there will be uh, different technological breakthroughs and improvements of a pharmacological knowledge that would allow us to extend a lifespan. But there is a double question. Is the, the required technology to live forever or even to double the life expectancy of human beings as it is today? The issue is not today. Uh, so this is the, my, the main focus of this debate. As Richard mentioned before, many of the technological breakthroughs and developments, such as, for example, anti-cholesterol drugs like statins are incredibly good, despite the fact that they have loads of side effects. Most drugs have side effects, uh, and most of the pharmacological products that are the result of science and research in the last 10 to 15 years have, obviously, undesirable side effects. And even some, some drugs that have been used in animal models to 
expand the average life expectancy by 15 to 20 percent, and that are actually used as well in human beings for the treatment of other pathologies, also have side effects. So if we use such drugs from a contemporary perspective, we will be able to maybe increase our lifespan by 15 to 20 percent. And we will reach approximately 122, which has been the maximum ever recorded for a human being. So my optimistic uh, position here is that all of the new technologies that have been developed and all those technologies that are still not used in human beings, such as, for example, uh, genomic editing, you might have heard about uh, the modification of the genome of all species existing in the world at least the experimental model uh, uh, to develop that particular knowledge exists and there's been involvement of Spanish researchers and this allows us to modify the genome including siblings at all levels stem cells, embryos, fetus, neonate and obviously as well in adults in all tissues so the use of these technologies would allow us undoubtedly to at least prevent some of the pathologies and medical issues that are connected with the biggest mortality rates recorded today. And those technologies, once again, would allow us to expand our lifespan and our life expectancy uh, to a certain extent. And the great revolution that I referred at the beginning of my presentation was, should we struggle and fight to try to have mechanisms that extend our youth because this will give us resistance to the development of diseases? And that that's where knowledge is still very limited and undoubtedly if there's something that we require and need is to continue to research on that particular knowledge and as Aubrey mentioned before, the way to do so is to convince financial institutions and politicians to provide us with financial resources to be able to advance this knowledge and to make it useful to improve the quality of life of human beings because what we desire is not only to avoid diseases but also to avoid the biggest risk there is for the development which is the agent process itself. Sorry? Can I have Vicente 30 seconds? <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> no. No, I don't know. Okay. Uh, Not now, I'm sorry. So we just have one minute for your counter. Yeah. Uh, okay. I'd like Carlos on my team because that is clearly where he is. <laughs> Okay. I would like to make one impo two important points. One, it is clear to me from what Carlos has said that he envisages extension of the healthy period of life, but within normal human boundaries, which is our position. Thank you for supporting us. The other thing <laughs> no, that's not is the question. <laughs> yeah. The other thing is that the lack of support that we have for this work is not because of a lack of success. Eighty percent of the population of Britain, no better, no worse than the people here, favor supporting research on aging. I believe that the focus on extended life rather than health is a barrier to using those people's support. That's why the internet is dominated by people who want to live forever, and that is what people see when they look at our work, and I find that very difficult. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I would like now to use this little moment to mention the fact that Carlos, uh, I would like just to promote Regaices de Ciencia because uh, precisely the next debate that will take place in December will be about the possibility of having uh, genetic editing in human beings so we can actually just plot the topic and announce it a little bit for the actual time. <laughs> and yes, a round of applause indeed. Thank you. So let's move on. Let's go to the third round of this debate. Let's uh, ask ourselves the following question. Has the first immortal human being uh, uh, been born already? <laughs> Has it actually been born or not? It's your turn, yeah. All right. Well, so <laughs> as we have already established, the use of words like immortality and living forever somewhat distorts the topic that we actually want to discuss, namely the 
development of technologies that will keep people healthy and as a side effect keep people alive for a longer amount of time and the time frame for the development of those technologies. Now, therefore, if I would rephrase the question, we could say, has the first person been born already who will remain biologically youthful as long as they live, uh, even if they do not get hit by a truck or die from anything that has nothing to do with how long ago they were born. And I think that there is a very high probability that that is indeed the case, that the technologies which will bring aging under the same level of medical control that we have today over most infectious diseases will be developed within the next 50 years or so and that they will not just slow down the decline that people today experience in old age, they will reverse that decline so that they will bring people's biological age as defined by how they function, both physically and mentally, back to what it was at a younger age. And furthermore, I believe that it's highly likely that once we have technologies which can do that, f that thing reasonably well, we will continue to, develop, to improve those technologies so that we can do it better and better and theref therefore keep that person's health one step ahead of the problem. I think that, as I said earlier, there is at least a 10% chance that we won't get to that point for the next 100 years. But I think that there's at least a 50-50 chance that we will get there in time to allow quite a lot of people who are, have already been born to benefit from those technologies. What does that mean? We have already spoken about the, d the link between staying healthy for a longer amount of time and staying alive for a longer amount of time. I do not believe that it is biologically plausible that we will ever develop technologies that will extend our healthy lifespan by, for example, 20 years but will not extend our total lifespan by more than two years. I just don't think that's biologically plausible. I think that to a fairly good approximation we will see life extension tracking health extension however far we push them. I'll stop there. <laughs> because I don't know if I'm getting 30 seconds yeah, yeah, yeah. or a week or two and a half years. Okay. Right. Here we go. Come on. Um. Three minutes and a half. It, it's happening. Yes, it's there. Okay, I think I can speak for everybody when we answer, has the first immortal human been born? No. No, and they never will be. Okay, we all agree on this, provided you define an immortal organism as something which has no chance of dying. Humans will never fit that description, and just as an aside, even if you assume limitless technological advance, that won't help you. Any civilization that can build a god can build a god killer. Okay. Unfortunately, journalists use the term immortal to describe what Aubrey and I, I think, would call non-aging. All right. These are organisms that have a fixed chance of death each year rather than the exponentially increasing chance of death we see in humans and other animals. Non-aging organisms are not biologically impossible. I've worked on them and um, you can find them in nature. The point of difference between us is that Aubrey believes the first non-aging human may already have been born or can be created. Um, he thinks it's plausible and I think he's told you why that we will progressively improve initial treatments such that the capacity re to repair any damage in the body always exceeds the damage that is present. I disagree, but the line of argument cannot and should not be dismissed out of hand. I don't share the optimism for really two reasons. The first is the staccato nature of technological improvement. 
where you often see very rapid progress followed by stalls. An example of this would be the dramatic improvement in aircraft in the early part of the 20th century. From the first powered flight in 1903, we went to jet aircraft breaking the sound barrier by 1947. Hypersonic aircraft traveling at Mach 5 were first proposed in 1951. And although hypersonic flight was briefly achieved in 1967, for 50 years progress has stalled because the materials required to construct aircraft capable of flying at those speeds don't exist. I think the chances of a technology stall for longevity are high. Aubrey thinks they're low. Gentlemen can agree to differ. Okay. My second reason for pessimism is that I'm not confident that all the causes of damage, as, as Aubrey tends to put it, are known and are included in the ontology he published about 20 years ago. Um, as recently as January of this year, I, th I think you said something to the effect of, it's very clear that my categorization is exhaustive, that there's only seven categories, there's not some category number eight waiting to be discovered. I think there is, and I think it has recently been reported by my collaborator, Professor Lorna Harris, and I predicted this would happen some years ago, that there would be an eighth, a ninth, and a tenth mechanism that we did not know about that would limit lifespan. It's the loss of ability to properly splice RNA as a result of diverse mechanisms. I know when time's short in debate, you tend to say, just please go away and read my stuff. So I'm afraid now I'm going to have to say to you, please go away, read mine. Sorry, Aubrey. Just. Well, I think that one minute for rebuttal is going to be particularly useful. It is true that uh, we seem to be coming to common ground in our presentations and ideas, but I still struggle to understand certain positions and despite the development in time, and that's the cut to development of technology that you mentioned before, and this is something that obviously science suffers from. But it is also true, on the other hand, that in certain things, specifically biomedical technologies, we've actually observed that the acceleration of the development is extraordinary. I'm just going to give you the example, for example, what I mentioned before, the genome editing process that was discovered roughly 12 years ago. And in these 12 years, we've moved from just having a basic preventative model applied to bacteria to a model whereby the human species genome can be actually modified. And we've actually attempted those modifications. So the consequences of those technological breakthroughs are unpredictable. And if there's something that we can actually actually claim is that making predictions is difficult on a future that is actually impossible. So we reach to the fourth uh, round, this, this, this fourth round, this tennis match where we wonder about the following. Can we actually afford the consequences of increased lifespan? Well, we might think, for example, how death would be, because obviously recognize the fact that this would not be lives that would be completely immortal or eternal. There will be extended lives that will last for a very long time, and we will finally get to a point where we can decide when to end with those lives. So how would people die, I wonder? They would die committing suicide by accident by violent acts or by executions and post-executions. I don't know if these four scenarios are particularly stimulating. These are not very stimulating death scenarios, but I can't, I can't hardly see any other possibility about you know, putting an end to um, a life when, when one's living forever. I still advocate for the possibility of having a peaceful death, full of sense, full of meaning within my finite existence. Secondly, 
let's think about retirement. Okay, obviously, one might think that living forever means working for 30 years and then spending 3,000 years in a wonderful life of retirement, uh, sailing uh, on board of a yacht. And, uh, somewhere in the South Pacific. It's obviously not the case, right? We would have to reformulate existence and we would have to uh, actually continue to work for a longer time because they will be healthy and perhaps we will have to work forever. So when will the time for retirement come? That will be another big question, right? Uh, obviously, we don't formulate ideas such as this. It is basically unsustainable. It's impossible. Let's think, for example, about reproduction. If one lives for thousands of years, how many children do we actually have? Well, one might think, okay, more or less like now, one, you have the experience, it's cool, that's it. But if you live for thousands of years, you might have actually thousands of experience you want to have. So how many children would you actually have? What sort of relationship are you going to have with your family? Because now, obviously, you're going to be your, uh, your son's father. But when your son is roughly 1,084 years and you are, I don't know, 1,890 years old, uh, would there be still a meaningful sense for this father-to-son relationship? What kind of um, emotional relationships would we have? I can say I have a couple, I have, I have had two partners in life, three, four, but they all have a place in my limited lifespan, full of meaning and full of recognition. But when we have endless partners, because I'm going to live for 7,000 years, so I can have hundreds of thousands of partners in a lifetime, what would be the meaning of the intense emotional relationships that we have in our finite existences as of today? Let us think as well about... Um, imprisonment. How long would we punish people for corruption, uh, crime, if they can live forever? So, uh, the theoretical framework that scientists are presenting to us is it's loads of fun until we actually think about the real world. And the real world, what requires is actually a meaningful life and a peaceful death. And in order to achieve that, we need all the resources that are possible for science to achieve such thing. I'm going to answer this question. Well, since we are just getting close to the end, I want you to be a little bit provocative. Scientific breakthrough does not pursue uh, uh, an abuse of technology and knowledge. As Lord Henry states it, it is a passion, and the best way to overcome a passion is to be dragged by this passion. And this has been the way that human beings have got to what we are today. Roughly 3,000 years ago, there were different species of human beings and homo sapiens on earth and the only one that has actually dominated the entire environment has been homo sapiens not only because homo sapiens wanted to live better or longer than anybody else because they have a natural instinct of understanding the world and getting to know the world and this has led us to where we are today and this knowledge is what actually produces all of the incredible scientific breakthroughs and technological development that we have experienced in human beings so Gravitational waves that have just been described and visualized and having uh, corpuscular waves and light and whatnot does not really have an aim of improving the quality of life of human beings or looking for other planets. It's actually because human beings have this innate, inherent capacity of discovering what nobody has ever discovered before, regardless of whether it's useless or useful. And most of the things might be useful in the end, like, for example, monoclonal antibodies are essential nowadays for um, a diagnosis and survival of several diseases were discovered for by um, George Kellan and Cesar Miller without really knowing what monoclonal antibodies were for. Uh, immune, immunotherapy, which is essential for very aggressive forms of cancer, uh, was discovered by Jane Allison and, and TACMAC, uh, just basically trying to understand how cells grew and they transformed themselves and what mechanisms they used to do so. So let us not look for a, a response or an answer to this intrinsic need to look for knowledge that is part of human beings. All of these achievements, all of these breakthroughs have had 
an incredible ability to improve our quality of life, and that's why I believe and I insist on the fact that we have to continue to work on this particular line to increase our intrinsic ability to know. The problem is that sometimes implementing such knowledge in society is slow. As I mentioned before, and I would like to insist on this again, cultural change, cultural um, transformation is much slower than scientific development. So, for example, measures like monoclonal antibodies were discovered in 1974 and have been started to be used in 12 and 2012. Gravitational waves that have just been discovered will probably not be used in, I don't know, 20 to 30 years. But there they are for uh, the benefit of the community. And that's what I believe is the biggest challenge in our future. If we wish uh, contemporary diseases to be treated and prevented, we need to develop uh, youth and extend it. Uh, otherwise, it will be incompatible because the costs of new technologies that might prevent and cure uh, these diseases is extraordinary, so it can be from $20,000 per patient to $500,000 per patient, and that, if we do not change our approach to the knowledge of disease, is completely unsustainable with the current social model we have. <laughs> so, I am absolutely horrified that uh, uh, Vicente got the biggest round of applause of the evening so far. Basically what you're telling us here is that you would prefer your mother to get Alzheimer's because you don't know how they're going to pay the pensions. Stop. Okay. Um, I, we cannot, okay, just to deal with this. We cannot afford unhealthy lives for our older people today. And good health for the people we care about is a good deal for them and a good deal for society. I have already said this. But there is a question we need to deal with, which is how much benefit would society derive from giving an extra century of healthy life to the same person? This isn't easy. It's never been calculated. The re in essence, the question is, how much life does the right to life give you? It's not academic because spending on social good rapidly runs into the law of diminishing returns. If anybody asks, I will talk about that. I would end by saying, someone who thinks only of their rights and that everyone should be free to do what they want won't consider what I'm saying. And that is because they are selfish and I don't want their vote. Thank you. Sí. Well, there were just like 50 seconds there. If you want to use those 15 seconds, and would you like to use them? Oh, well, the counter has reached zero. There's been a little change there from one speaker to the other. Well, anyways, um, we've just finished the second part of our reifa, and let's move on to question time, where the people in the audience will have a chance to ask as many questions as they wish, and all the people here today. Um, you can ask globally to a team or to each of everyone of there. So please, I'll ask you in as much as possible to make brief interventions and ask questions. Please do not make reflections about life because we won't have time to do so. So just brief questions if possible. Thank you. Eh, bueno. El profesor Martínez Alonso, profesor Martínez Alonso and Dr. Dupree uh, spoke about the revolution of antibiotics in terms of increasing lifespan. Nowadays, uh, we have the problem of resistances that nowadays uh, it looks like uh, it's difficult to solve or it can't be solved. So we'd like to ask you whether it is very ambitious to uh, want to live forever and whether societies should get ready to uh, decrease in the quality of life caused by this resistant bacteria. It's perfectly correct and this is one of the great problems that we have today, those bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics, but uh, the scientific community is working all the time on new procedures for these problems. And in the 
pipeline of production, there is new ways of generating new antibiotics or new treatments against these bacteria uh, through the modification of the membrane, which are different from the uh, treatment of uh, conventional uh, antibiotics. And this is a new uh, pathway that's been opened, and uh, it's about uh, stopping uh, bacteria which are more and more resistant to conventional antibiotics. It's an important treatment, but there is a huge amount of uh, microbiologists who are working on these kinds of issues at the moment. Would you like to comment on that? I just had. I, I was listening to several people. At the, the, same question, time. the yeah. question was about the bacteria that are resistant to the antibiotics these days. So, yeah. okay. Um, I think one of the things we. I think one of the things that this brings out is this whole question that I was trying to explore about social goods and social benefits. Okay which is the question for a government and the question for any responsible citizen, is where can I spend a euro, a dollar, a pound to do the most good? Nobody wants to spend money typically to do bad things. What happens, of course, is that if you look, for example, at increasing preschool enrollment in sub-Saharan Africa from about 20% to about 60%, it generates about $35 of good for every dollar you spend. However, if you take that same cohort and put them into secondary school, you earn only $4 of good for every dollar you spend. You run into diminishing returns. And so any sensible science policy and any sensible government, I think, will trade off what is the useful return from medicines that improve health in older people versus what is the useful return in, um, for example, combating antibiotic resistance. Now, for aging, simply reducing the risk factors that we all have for two age-associated conditions generates about $150 in social benefit. It's a good deal. It's a good trade-off. How you frame it depends on your own ethical um, lens, which I'm not able to comment on. Yes. Regarding the last uh, question um, that you debated upon, um, uh, I would like to ask the question to the yes team. You were defended the stance about not living for longer, but to live longer, uh, younger, for a longer time. In other days, we have um, problems of food, of, uh, uh, there are countries which are not, um, have no food uh, sufficiency. So, how do you justify this uh, posture uh, in the face of this problem? <laughs> well, All right, I'm going to give a simple answer and then I'm going to tell you what an idiot you are. Um, first of all, let's remember that the problem of resources is not simply a problem of how many people there are on the earth. It is a problem of the comparison between how many people there are on the Earth and how many people the Earth can sustain. And that second number does not stay constant over time. That second number can increase as a result of other technology. For example, if we, as we develop better renewable energy and artificial meat and so on, we will be able to increase the carrying capacity of the planet. Now, if we look at the rate at which those technologies are coming, we can see that it is virtually certain that the carrying capacity of the planet will rise much more rapidly than the population will rise. So we don't have to worry about some kind of trade-off between l d keeping people healthy in old age versus having environmental impact and resource limitations and so on. But now, let me tell you something else. Supposing you did have to make that choice, supposing by some terrible anti-miracle the technologies to increase the carrying capacity of the planet didn't happen, 
we just didn't get solar energy and so on, then you might be faced with the choice whether to let your mother get Alzheimer's or whether to have more kids. Which one would you choose? That's the choice that nobody who argues against this work ever honestly actually addresses. Okay, am I, uh, am I hmm? okay. Um, I will honestly address it in that case. And I don't think you're an idiot, unlike uh, Aubrey. I think you're a thoughtful and ethical citizen. <laughs> and <laughs> maybe all this, you've been thinking in a different way. You know? yeah. And uh, I'll try and explain why. Because there is a trap for the yes team that I don't think they have thought of. Okay, so. I'll start with this. Aubrey has, part of your argument is about inequality, okay? Aubrey's response was not, what do we do about inequality? It was to argue that resources will be infinite. Infinite resources owned by one person is not equality, okay? <laughs> there is, however, an argument um, about, you know, the carrying capacity of the earth and the things like this. This is dependent on progress. Everybody here believes that progress will occur, all right? The problem goes like this. Human well-being is not limited by stuff. There is no more stuff here than there was a thousand years ago. It is just used in much cleverer ways. And those cleverer ways we call ideas. And ideas come from human minds. And... If you have the same minds for very long periods of time and a constant population, you have fewer new minds. And if you have fewer new minds, you have a lower rate of progress, which means the carrying capacity of the Earth that Aubrey thinks limitless technological progress will develop will not come because the stagnation of humanity is slowing the rate of progress down. Okay, those I think are, that I think is an important point when we discuss things like this. The other thing about choices and your mother with Alzheimer's disease versus children, I'm ever so sorry, we choose those all the time. We don't put those choices quite as starkly, but we as citizens have all chosen them. When we choose to drive faster than 20 miles an hour, all right, when we say people are allowed to do that, we choose to kill people because if the speed limit was below um, 20 miles an hour, most people hit in accidents would live. We do not choose to do that. Therefore, we have chosen to kill those people. When we say a drug is too expensive in our healthcare systems, we have made a judgment that the 55,000 pounds we might spend on a drug is better spent on other people. We don't ask you to do it to your own parents or your own child because the short answer is how much money would I spend on my son's health? All of it and all of yours. However, each of us as citizens has a duty to every other citizen to make sure that everybody gets the best deal because that's what being part of a community is about. We look after each other, not our own selfish interests. Thank you. Ahí, sí. Creo que... Well, please be brave so that we can have another question. Uh, just one minute. I agree what Richard said, but this, it's evident that this is a very ethical question. You know, new uh, technologies in the field of uh, extension of life or extension of youth, this nowadays, unfortunately, uh, for a society like our society, Western society, we can afford this kind of thing. But this in best of cases, uh, corresponds to a fifth of the uh, population of the world. The rest of the world uh, are poor people. Uh, they had, with just water and bread, they would increase their lifespan. So I think it's important to establish the debate in one or other regard. What I have tried to say is that in a Western society like our society, what are the possibilities of progress? And there is a great uh, debate uh, in the 
ethical area. This is only applicable for a fifth part of the population of the world, and the rest of the world population is never going to have access to this kind of debate. And this is an extraordinary uh, issue, but I think that is not and the debate. Uh, I mean, it's not doesn't correspond to today's debate. This is a question that we get from Twitter by Marisa Castiñeira, who is asking the YES team who would regulate the new health system, countries, international bodies? It's not new. This is just medicine. The only difference between the medicine we're talking about tonight and the medicine that exists today is that the medicine that exists today for the elderly doesn't work and the medicine we're talking about will work but the fact that it works doesn't change how it will be regulated mm -hmm. gracias sí tenemos otra pregunta arriba sí sí funciona I've heard things about whether a human being would be able to, whether it would be good or bad for human beings. My question is, would the world in we live in today, or in the, uh, the other living beings uh, that live on this world, would they be able to uh, stand a human being who would live for another 50 years? <laughs> It's true that the social situation of today, uh, I mean, the question in taking into consideration today's situation would be no. If someone is asked this question and if someone is retires after 50 years old and if, if they extend their life and they have no other alternative in terms of social integration, this would be unbearable in terms of life. There are some authors, writers who have described this. Saramago and Borges, for example, who have said that this social structure that we have today is not compatible with this lifespan. Uh, uh, but this is why this scientific change has to be associated with a social restructuration, which makes these two things compatible. And again, what scientists do, or what we think we should do, is to um, bring closer to the society, to young people, to elderly people, to politi politicians, and, and so on and so forth to give them the chance to decide how we want this new social structure and this debate has not existed and I don't think that is going to exist because we live in a society which is uh, democratically participative but decisions are made by politicians and many of this knowledge or these theories or these possibilities are ignored in the best of cases by politicians so it depends on us it's up to us citizens to you know we are the ones who have to be able to change this structure, to change the society, to build a future society, uh, and whereby we, we need to be committed to. You need to be, you who are younger than me, you need to, to be committed to this new society, this future society. What we are advocating, which is good health with our normal lifespans today, is good for all the things we care about. I've already shown you and the figures are available. If we could translate the improvements in health, just the small ones that we see in laboratory animals into the general population, the United States saves about $7 trillion gross, about $4 trillion net out to 2050. That is money that can be spent on any of the world's problems. If we don't do this, we will have to spend that money to look after sick people. I don't want to look at the end of my life and see that my contribution to the world was to help keep more people than ever before, more sick and more miserable than ever before. I do not see that as a win. Okay, so health is a good deal because it allows us to solve other problems. Extended lifespan 
may not be such a good deal. In fact, we think, and we stress we think, this is a battle of ideas, not a battle of certainties, that it probably won't be, but the calculations have not been done. And they need to be done now when we think the possibility of long extended lifespans is remote, rather than afterwards when people are trying to work out what happens. And that could be, in my, th I would, you know, Aubrey wants time scales, 200 years from now. And the world will be a different place. Well, I think that if we are able to achieve a higher degree of health in the uh, old age is a something good. Then if we have as a collateral effect, as a side effect, uh, an increase of the uh, length of this life, then we might think about how to manage that. But the idea of pursuing an objective which is uh, increasing lifespan, when the, this life is generating so many uncertainties, I don't think it's necessary. In any case, I think it's interesting to maybe um, um, to place science where it has to be. Uh, we have said that the um, carrying capacity of the world is unlimited and that the life of human beings can be uh, extended. And this is said in the world of science. And methodology is very rigorous in the world of science because the smallest um, calculation mistake uh, means that uh, that uh, experiment is going to be a failure. So it is uh, funny that from the point of view of uh, science uh, there are these uh, discourses which are totally alien to the science uh, um, discourse really because it's some sort of a utopia. So I would like to put science where it has to be and where does science has to be. Well, um, on the one hand science gives us an instrumental knowledge but it doesn't tell us anything about the uh, meaning of our existence and it doesn't increase our knowledge and our uh, personal and ethical uh, um, development. So I think that we need to have into consideration all these variables and because only by investing money on science and uh, research we're not going to achieve uh, the best uh, world ever, uh, enabling people to be able to live for a long time uh, in a world which is going to have a, a, a limited carrying capacity. And for those who say that uh, there are also those who say that we might be able to live in other countries also uh, with similar conditions to the ones we have here. So I need that we need to be more realistic in terms that we need to give uh, science its role, but without forgetting that uh, uh, human beings nowadays in their con limited conditions can achieve a level of uh, fullness that or completeness uh, that has to be promoted. <laughs> well, Vicente has brought to the table several issues that can uh, be dealt with in debates like this for many years. Okay, last question from the audience. I am a scientist and uh, science doesn't say that uh, the current capacity of the world is Ill unlimited. I think it's the opposite. I don't know where this figure comes from. I think that a limited uh, entity such as the Earth uh, has limitations in this regard. Um, the example of the car uh, that's been mentioned, um, cars that uh, work for many years, and you know you can change different pieces in that car uh, at any given time. And comparing this with uh, the human being, with the human body, with millions of complex cells coexisting with uh, a huge amount of bacteria, 
eh, conocer el estado de, en cada momento de este, de este And cuerpo. It's also, I mean, eh, it's difficult to know the exact state of this es buena body. Para otra cosa, que es que, But this comparison is good uh, for something else probably. Uh, which uh, cars so are the ones which are still Uh, functioning after many years, maybe those which have been, you know, taken care of, investing lots of money by their millionaire owners. So maybe this project about uh, extending life or extending youth, maybe this is a project that would be available for a small amount of people, you know. Because this would be to the expense of uh, the majority of the population of the world. We will have people living for a long time, but to the expense of the majority of the world. So, the question about the, 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 the mention of the carrying capacity of the planet being unlimited. The first time that came up was when Richard said that I had said that, which I didn't. I actually said that the carrying capacity of the planet is very likely to rise more rapidly than the population of the planet, but they will both continue to be finite. As for the possibility that these technologies, as and when they arrive, they will only be available to wealthy people, I think I would simply direct you to what Richard already says and amplify on it. Richard pointed out that it is extremely expensive to let people get sick when they get old. The problem that we have today is that we don't have the alternative of giving them medicine that stops them from getting sick when they get old. And when we do get that medicine, it will pay for itself at the level of the government, at the level of the nation, very, very rapidly. In fact, Richard somewhat understated that, co that case because what he didn't mention was, for example, the fact that the kids of the elderly are less productive these days because they have to spend time and effort looking after their sick parents and that the elderly are not able to contribute wealth to society because they are sick, whereas if they were still youthful, they would be able to. All in all, it is perfectly clear that any country which chose not to make these therapies available to everybody who was old enough to need them would go bankrupt very quickly because the country would be spending a lot of money that other countries were not spending. Um, I can possibly put a little figure on this that gives it... Now, the, the key point of this, and I don't want to lose it, is this. We contend that health, healthy older people today with lives about the size that most people out there say they want, even with perfect health, is an unparalleled good. Okay? It is a good thing. Some of, these, some of the things that we could use are relatively cheap. Rapamycin, for example, costs about £10 a day on the National Health Service. Many of my colleagues believe it might be beneficial in treating mild cognitive impairment. We don't know yet, and we don't have the money to find out. But it costs the National Health Service £60 a day to keep somebody in that unfortunate condition with no hope that they might get better. So I think however you cut the cake, the argument that providing healthy lives of the length that most people say they want is a very, very good deal. What is very questionable, however you look at it, ethically, from the point of view of a futurologist trying to talk about progress, is the idea of hugely extended lives, starting with a significant extension of, say, 30 or 40 years, lives of 150, 200. Aubrey is famous for saying the first thousand-year-old person has um, already been born. These seem to be unethical. The cost-benefit analysis, if you look at things in those terms, looks very dangerous to me, and I believe that it could blunt the progress of the human race in ways that we have not really considered seriously. That, I think, is the crunch point between the two sides. Muchas gracias.
Cerramos las cuestiones del público. So we're going to close uh, this question and answer session and we are going to move on to the final conclusions, to the concluding remarks. The speakers have one minute each to um, highlight uh, what they think is most important and then, uh, well, just have into consideration that the audience is going to vote uh, uh, their answer, you know, for the question again. So, Carlos, first. Uh, well, just to, um, well, my position, and, and I am, uh, well, is that science has shown that it's able to develop new technologies to improve the quality of life and fight diseases. And then the other issue is whether aging is another disease, regardless of the answer yes or no. Is it a risk factor in terms of the development of the pathologies that lead to mortality nowadays? And this is very important, or from the scientific point of view, it's very important to try and tackle this in order to avoid the development of uh, diseases, not only to improve the quality of life of individuals, but also because this would involve uh, to save costs, to save a lot of money. Secondly, it is true that, um, you know, the beginnings are going are going to be difficult, but over time uh, things are going to be cheaper and this is going to reach all the population. Firstly, immortality is impossible. And secondly, greatly extended lives are so unlikely today that you can discount that possibility. But in the far future, my second assertion won't be true. But the question before us tonight is not, can science help us live forever? It is not, when will it happen? It is, should science help us live forever? It is a moral question. Those seeking to become non-aging are already selfish. Their philosophers have turned concern for themselves above others into a law of moral conduct. Why then are we surprised that decent people don't support our work or want a thousand-year lifespan when they go on the internet and see the kind of person who does? So stand with us. Vote no. Vote with us. <laughs> <laughs> Many years ago, a famous uh, gerontologist named Bob Butler coined the word ageism, which means discrimination against people who were born a long time ago, uh, uh, by comparison with sexism or racism and so on. And he didn't think much of ageism, and I don't think much of it either. I think that how long ago you were born should not determine your entitlement to health. I also find it rather strange that some of my colleagues, like Richard, are willing to say that health is good but life extension is much more ambiguous, but will not actually contradict my assertion that extending healthy life is certain to extend total life by a comparable amount, and furthermore that the more we do it, since we are not ageist, the more we will want to continue to do it. I will, however, point out that we won't have any thousand-year-old people for at least 900 years, whatever happens, and we'll have plenty of time to figure out what to do about any problems that having such people will cause. Bueno, pues llega el momento... Okay, so... Vicente. <laughs> Ah, perdón. <laughs> perdón. Sorry about that. Vicente, por favor. Muchas gracias. So, Vicente has the floor. Responder que no a si la ciencia debería ayudarnos a vivir. Okay, so, 
saying no, answering no to this question, it's not turning our back to science or to the progress of humankind. It is about focusing on the priorities that we think are important. Firstly, to uh, give uh, resources, to allot resources to the achievement of the um, sustainable development goals that were approved by the United Nations 2015 uh, and have to be achieved by 2030. If we achieve this, we would be increasing uh, to a great extent life expectancy in countries which have no uh, or, or have a very low level of life expectancy and we would be avoiding debts which are avoidable debts in, instead of thinking about uh, utopias. Uh, secondly, it is about guaranteeing a good death for everybody. The Nobel, P Nobel Prize has advocated never abandon me. And thirdly, uh, uh, do research in healthy aging. Okay, so thank you very much. And now it's time to vote again after this uh, fruitful exchange of ideas and opinions. It's time to vote. You have your remotes, so please go ahead and use them. So you have three options. Number one, well, yes. Number two, no. Number three, I don't know. And while you press your buttons, let's uh, sing uh, Regaifa. My friends, my friends, who wants to live forever? Depending on how the situation is, I can say that it depends. <laughs> well, this uh, is like traditional Galician song. If we do research on Viagra, if we do research on Viagra, more research in Viagra than in preventing uh, Alzheimer. If we do more research regarding Viagra and then Alzheimer, we're going to be very powerful old people. But if we want to be able to use our instrument uh, correctly, we need to take care of our mind. Are we lost in translation here? If we live for a thousand years, if we live for a thousand years, I have a concern about living for a thousand years. Well, there was a time in my life when I was uh, concerned about my heart, about the health of my heart, and they told me not to be worried about it because I was going to have it for the rest of my life. So if we live for a thousand years, I would be worried about something which is that with so many centenarians who is going to get their pension. So I hope you live for many years and I hope that I can be there to see it. And if you haven't done this yet, please vote and press the button now. Thank you. Okay, now, uh, while they count the votes, we're going to have uh, a draw. We have two t-shirts. So, uh, we're going to take a number, get out a number. Two numbers, actually. So check the number of your remotes. It's number 24. Who has number 24? Okay, you have one a t-shirt. And this is 40. Number 40, who's got number 40? 
Okay, so congratulations, you've won a wonderful Reggae Fast t-shirt. Okay, um, so finally I would like to say that this uh, initiative is possible thanks to FECIT, which is the Spanish Foundation for Science and Technology. You have all the information on Reggae Fast at uh, reggaefast.org. And, uh, well, uh, in weddings, when these Reggae Fast, these debates, these competitions were made, the winner would receive a piece of bread, which is called a Reggae Fast. So here we have uh, one of these loaves of bread. So we're going to give it to you, to our guest speakers. Uh, as well as a present, you know, to thank you for for having been here with us today. It's made with which kind of wheat? I don't know. It's made. It's the best kind of bread you can get here. It's white bread, actually. It's made with white bread. Okay. Can you in Reguefa? I think you should have the bread. I perdí la traducción. Gracias. Bueno, es la primera vez que me regalan. It's the first time I get a present like bueno, this. Eh, ya hecho este tiempo, eh, nuestro grupo okay. de cómputo me da so, el té. Vamos a ver uh, the votes. Ante la pregunta, si debería la ciencia so, ayudarnos for the question, a vivir para siempre, help us live forever? The um, 24% said yes in the uh, voting that we did at the beginning, 64% said no, and 12% said I don't know. And after the debate, these are the answers. 33% said yes, 61% said no, and I don't know, 7% uh, said I don't know. So thank you very much and see you in our next uh, debate. Sometimes democracy are wrong. <laughs> They won, but they won. They, they were already. They were the winner from the very beginning already. No. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But some, I, I think was most of the people that they didn't say, they didn't know what to say. Actually, they vote for us at the end. No. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the outcome. Yeah. Yeah. yeah.